Well, hello everybody and welcome once again to Faith Fellowship Sunday School. I've been trying to make sure I give you something that I believe you can use to work with in your walk with the Lord. Last week we talked about forgiveness, how it sets you free, actually, the one who forgives. And today we're going to change direction a little bit and talk about being the bigger person. Being the bigger person has nothing to do with your physical size or stature, but it has everything to do with your character and maturity as a believer. Being the bigger person, that's what we want to talk about today. In every situation where there's two or more people involved, somebody's got to rise up and be the one who understands and knows how to conduct his or herself to bring calm, peace, resolve, healing, whatever the situation may require. So somebody in that group, if there is a misunderstanding or if there is an issue that could bring strife and division, somebody's got to be the bigger person. And as you know, as Christians, we have a very, very high calling. And that's why I want to bring these videos from time to time to just bring into focus God's expectation of us in every situation. I'm going to read to you from the book of Colossians to begin with and tell me what you think. This is Paul, the apostle, speaking to the church at Colossae in chapter 1, verse 10. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance. And that inheritance is that being co-heirs with Christ. So it's important to bring biblical messages to us so that you can participate in the divine nature so that in the course of your life and as you go through things, you'll be able to kind of look at it like this. What would the Lord have me to do in this given circumstance? Now, being the bigger person is not something that God is asking us to do without equipping us to do it. And I'm talking to believers, so this is important. If God is calling us to be this bigger person in every situation, then God has to equip us. And believe it or not, God has already equipped you for everything you're going through, and God wants you to grow in it. In the book of Galatians chapter 5, Paul tells the church at Galatia something, as well as us, something very important, an investment that has been made in us by God that we already have. We're in possession of this as believers. The question is, is do we tap into it or not? So in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. In other words, the old way that you used to handle things or when you found yourself in a maybe verbal altercation with somebody, friend, brother or sister in Christ, husband, wife, whatever, on your job, there is a biblical response that God is looking for from us. And God has the right to ask it because God has equipped us with joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and above all, self-control. And our old way, our old flesh, that guy, that girl exists no more. So maybe you were an argumentative person in the past. Maybe you were someone who always ended up in conflict and usually the other person had to acquiesce or give in so that the matter would just quiet down. Doesn't mean it's resolved. It's just quieted down because, because the baby was pouting and so everybody had to do something to quiet the baby. And see, that's not our calling in Christ. God has called us to big things. And so when the bigger person emerges, something happens. Now, I don't want to talk about being the bigger person, meaning winning the argument. That's not the point. You know, the bigger person is not interested in just winning the argument or just commanding the moment. No, 
That's not the goal. Listen to what it says in Matthew 18, a verse I've read many times, verse 15. If your brother sins or your sister, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. So the real goal of the bigger person is to win the person over, not to appease them, not to just go along with what's uh, maybe unjust or just letting them have their way for the purpose of, you know, silencing them. He's talking about winning them over. You see, if a husband wins a f argument or a debate or a issue over his spouse, maybe he won the point, but did he bless his marriage? So winning the point is one thing, but the greater goal for the bigger person is to win your brother, to win them over, to win your sister and bring resolve and bring healing. Being the bigger person, that's the point today, being the bigger person. In what situation? Well, any and all. Um, well, what does that mean for me? Does that mean sacrifice sometimes? Absolutely. Does that mean I may have to forgive someone who may not be ready to ask for forgiveness? Yes. Does it mean that knowing that I'm right, I just, I know I'm right. You know, my point is just, I, you need to give in to my point because I'm right. Well, that's not what being the bigger person means. Now, it would be great if you were by wisdom, patience, and kindness, get your point across because it actually is right and then you still win your brother or sister, you have done very well. This is what Paul meant when he said, whatever you do, conduct yourself in a manner that is pleasing to the Lord. What would God say about the way you handle differences or how you uh, end up in confrontation with others? Do you become the bigger person or do you always need someone to be bigger than you? It's a very important point because if we live long enough, we're going to be in some kind of contention with somebody. It doesn't matter. One day, somewhere, sometime, we're going to find ourselves in the middle of some kind of debate, some kind of disagreement, some kind of confusion. And so the Bible commands us to conduct ourselves in a manner that's pleasing to God. Now, when you were an unbeliever, consider that childishness because we were acting completely out of flesh as unbelievers, but Paul dealt with that. In fact, in all of our relationships, the goal is to be the bigger person, but also to be the mature person. They're one and the same. So Paul writes to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, another familiar verse. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child when I was a child. Yeah, that was appropriate when you were a child, but now you are a mature, believing Christian, and God has charged you to respond and be responsible in all that you do. He finishes, when I became a man, or when I became mature in the faith, I put the ways of childhood behind me. My immature days, my immature ways, they're over, they're done. They are no longer a part of my makeup. That's my goal, and I hope it's yours as well. So if you're married, the next time you end up in conflict, think, I have to be the bigger person. I need to be. But what if both of you were thinking about this? I'm going to be the bigger person. Think about how calm that conversation would go and how much easier it would be to find resolve if both parties said to themselves, I need to be the bigger person. Has nothing to do with physical size or stature, but character and maturity in the faith. That is the point. Now, when I read from Galatians 5, one of the things that I read or those qualities or attributes in that passage was this, self-control. Too many times in a dispute of some, time, of some kind, especially with husband and wife sometimes, there is this sense, and this is very childish, that whatever your response is, the other person made you do it. 
You made me hit you. You made me curse you. You made me go out and spend a lot of money just to calm myself. You made me do that. No, as a believer, I just told you, God made a great investment in you called the Holy Spirit. And that spirit or God's spirit has attributes. And one of them is self-control, self-control, the ability to control one's self. That's what it means. So now, as we look at the topic being the bigger person, we have some things to work with. First of all, you have been equipped by God. As a believer, you have been equipped by God. Number two, knowing that, are you willing to apply it? Number three, childishness is over. You're no longer a child. But when you were or immature in the faith, I think everybody kinds of expect, we kind of expect that your con conduct may reflect your youth. But now, as a m mature Christian, the Bible is commanding, calling you to be the bigger person. And remember also, the point in any dispute is to win your brother, to win your sister, not to compete with them and defeat them, but to win them over. That is what we do as believers. That's what God has called us to. Paul had a young protege by the name of Timothy, and Paul would teach Timothy many things, and he gave him some advice that is sound. It was sound then, and it's sound now. And it really requires, or it goes back to one of the fruit of the Spirit, but it requires you to be engaged enough with yourself to do this. You have to be engaged with you. You can't let the situation, the moment the person calls you to step outside of who you are. And remember, you can't blame it on them. You made me hit you. No, no, that's not going to work. It's not going to work. How would you like it if someone says, pow, you know, give you one in the kisser and then they tell you, you made me do that. I bet that's going to go over quite well, right? Hey, yeah, I deserve to get smacked. No, that's not what you would say. And that's not what you would feel. You would be very hurt. You would be angry. And if it's somebody you love, you would be very disappointed. And it could actually bring an end to a very, very important relationship. That between a husband and wife, two people in ministry together, people you work with on your job, uh, that could really be costly. So self-control depends on the person controlling one's self. No one else does it, you do. When God gave the Israelites the commandments, he laid them out for them and he says, now that you know what they are, follow them or well, now the responsibility is yours. I, the Lord, I've given them to you, now follow them. Well, of course, we couldn't, nor could they keep all of them. That's why God gave us grace through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But Paul gives Timothy this very, very sound instruction, and I believe it would be very useful for you today. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 5, but you, meaning you, the person listening right now, keep your head in all situations. Keep your head. As this thing is starting to escalate and feel like it's about to go out of control and could end up anywhere, you keep your head. Okay, this is what I'm gonna do right now. I, first of all, I'm going to take the non-offensive approach. approach. I'm not going to escalate this by presenting myself in, a, in an offensive manner or an aggressive manner. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to calm myself. I wish that in every situation I did that. And I've done it in a lot, but I could have done it in more. But now my goal is to disarm myself on purpose, taking away 
what could appear to be a level of aggression. I'm going to take that out of the equation. Some people ball their fist up, make faces, and that tells the person you're ready for battle. But then conversely, you know, calming yourself, lowering the volume, taking a step back, perhaps, uh, taking a very uh, non-aggressive posture, it could change things. It could change things a lot. And so you want to learn to, um, let's say, appear to be non-aggressive at all. And he continues this. He says, but you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship. Some things you're going to have to, you're going to have to take it sometimes. Meaning, okay, that was an insult. It was false. It was wrong. Uh, it's not true. I'm going to take this hit right now. I'm going to take it but I'm going to take it for the greater good. I'm going to turn this around, but I have to lower the temperature in the room right now. Do the work of an evangelist, discharge the duties, all the duties of your ministry. In other words, don't let your lack of self-control destroy your ministry. Don't let that happen to you. Don't allow your immaturity in your ability to walk in the spirit to destroy a very powerful ministry that God may have given you because you act out of control. You are very gifted. You're very talented. You can reach people, but you're known for your firing off out of control comments and pushback when you don't like something. That's a tough one for us. And many times the damage we do uh, can sometimes be irreparable. I hate to even use that word as though something can be destroyed, but you know this, the divorce rate is very, very high. And so marriages and families are broken all the time. And generally it goes back to what some like to call irreconcilable differences as a means of escape. I believe when two people are trying to be the bigger person, especially if they're Christians, most everything is reconcilable. Because forgiveness and grace, those are attributes that God has shown us. Therefore, he says, forgive as I have forgiven you. I believe nothing pleases God more when brothers and sisters walk together in harmony. His body is functioning well. We are the body of Christ. We're functioning well. Now, I'm going to read to you a brief story. We did do a little bit of a study on David um, before he became king because um, the anointing was placed on him by Samuel the prophet. Saul resisted him and pushed back on him because Saul felt like David was going to take his throne. No, God was going to take your throne because of your behavior. But he was going to make David pay for it or make sure it wasn't David that succeeded him. And so in a while David was on the run from Saul and this could have gone on for two years or more, maybe according to some many years, Saul was chasing David. But one day Saul was very, very vulnerable and he just didn't know it. And David did, though, and he could have taken advantage of Saul but he didn't. In this instance, David was the bigger person. Listen to what it says in 1 Samuel 24, starting in verse 1. It says, Saul was chasing David. It says, after Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told David is in the desert in En Gedi, the caves of En Gedi. Ah, so now I just finished chasing the Philistines. Now I'm going to chase David. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Very vulnerable. David and his men were far back in the cave. Saul didn't know it. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with them as you wish. God never said that. 
Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Saul was relieving himself. David crept up there, cut off the corner of his robe. He did. Now, he could have killed him, but he didn't. But the bigger person is almost always, for us as believers, bigger because of their consciousness toward God. It's not about the point. It's not about winning. Their consciousness toward God, that's what the bigger person senses within, within him, his or herself, and that is what governs their actions. As soon as you exclude God from the equation, disaster usually follows. So it says, afterward, David was conscious stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. Not only is he conscious stricken for not killing him, because he could have, but just cutting off the corner of his robe, David said, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I'm bigger than that. And besides, Saul is still God's anointed. I'm bigger than that. So it says, he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him. For he is the anointed of the Lord. And as believers, we're all children of God. It says, with these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went on his way. Saul was wrong. Saul shouldn't have been pursuing David. Saul put himself in a very vulnerable position but in this story, David was the bigger person. This is the way it should be. And it grieved him that he had even cut off a corner of his robe. That's consciousness toward God, the Holy Spirit within you. That's what that means. David was very conscious of how God's perspective of this matter unfolded, how God saw it. And that consciousness toward God, when you have it, the fear of the Lord, it will direct the affairs of your life, like Paul told Timothy, keeping your head in every situation. Now, David probably could have justified killing Saul, especially to his men. I mean, they were all in. Hey, you know what? Here he is. Take him. He probably could have won their favor. He probably could have ascended to the throne, or he would have sooner, maybe, depending on how God judged the matter. But David chose, as an act of his own will, to be the bigger person. You know what that's called biblically? That is called self-control, or the ability to control oneself. Even cutting off a portion of Saul's robe grieved David. It grieved him. Yes, David could have justified his actions for the moment, but it probably would have broken his heart. Just like it would feel perhaps when a husband wins the point, but his wife's heart's broken or vice versa. Yeah, you won the moment. Uh, you triumphed over your mate, but her heart is broken. How do you feel now? And you better say bad because we're not called to doing harm to people. We don't um, call evil good. So David did some things. He controlled his fears and his anger. He kept his self-control, was not influenced by outside voices. David used his inner witness, the Holy Spirit. David remembered God's word. He rebuked his men and then taught them wisdom. That's what a believer does. That's what a believer does. David controlled his fears. Saul's trying to kill me. I have every right to take him out. No, and then maybe my fears will go away or they will because Saul will be dead and not chasing me anymore. But, but he could control that emotion. David heard the inner witness in his spirit, even though the voices around him said, take him. David said, nah, I can't do that. I have a consciousness toward God and his word tells us, don't lay a hand on his anointed. 
So I'll switch gears a little bit and just apply a little something I learned while I was in the military. Everyone in the military is taught first aid because you never know when something could happen and you have to treat someone in the course of your duty. The rules of first aid were simply these. Stop the bleeding, protect the wound or dress the wound, wound and treat or prevent shock. Those three things, you just needed to remember those. Stop the bleeding. If you don't, they'll bleed out. If you don't stop the bleeding, your marriage can bleed out. Your friendships can bleed out. Your uh, things that are important, people that are important to you could bleed out. So stop the bleeding and then consciously begin to treat the wound and prevent shock, meaning long lasting damage. Those are the rules of first aid. Stop the bleeding. Got to do it. Treat the wound. You know what? I broke your heart. Or I could. Because we, there's a misunderstanding, your heart's broken. But if I can correct this, I can treat that brokenness with the truth through a very calm demeanor and presentation in love. Or, and I don't want long lasting damage, so I'm gonna treat you for shock. How about this? When, and just about everybody's, one, everybody at one time or another has gone through CPR. The ABCs of CPR, airway, breathing, circulation. In a relationship, if the person's not breathing, uh, eventually they're gonna die. Gotta have oxygen. Then you might have to provide it. You might have to speak life into that person. And then third, circulation. You got to pump that heart or treat that heart so that your patient will survive. These are very important. And those are perhaps ways to consider how to deal with a situation where you are called on to be the bigger person. Remember, there's bleeding. You got to stop the bleeding. Ooh, there's a wound. I have to treat it. And you know what? I got to make sure that there's not long lasting damage. Yeah. Being the bigger person. That's the calling God has on us. No matter what the circumstance, the Bible says, conduct yourself in a manner that is worthy of your calling in the Lord. Do this. In every situation, as Paul instructed Timothy, keep your head. Keep your head. Be the bigger person. You can do it. You have the Holy Spirit of the living God living on the inside of you. God bless you, big person. Until we talk next time, see ya.